Hey, welcome to Speechless. We are live here in St. Uh, well, I don't know if we're live in St. Paul. We're, we're coming out of the SCC studios. Evidently, uh, they're changing studios over there again, and we're not live in St. Paul. Um, this is the first show of, of Speechless for 2016. Uh, it's been quite a while. I was out in Oregon. Uh, well, I was with my family in Washington State for a couple weeks and then uh, went out to Oregon for a business trip. And beautiful weather out there, 45 to 60 degrees um, every day. Uh, only rained twice, once for two and a half weeks and once for two weeks. I mean, it just rained and it rained and it rained. Uh, unbelievable. Uh, we did have six nice days of no rain out there, and fortunately those were on the weekend. So I was only 150 feet off the beach, off we the ocean. We are live in St. Paul. We are live in St. Paul. Thank you very much for calling in. I, I heard the shows last night weren't live, so this is great. Uh, St. Paul, we're going to be talking about the school board meeting just a little bit. Uh, the committee of the board, which is really the school board meeting and I went down uh, with uh, the host from Inside Insight and filmed the whole thing four hours worth it seemed like uh, and you know a lot of discussion <laughs> that went on some good some bad but we're going to talk about that a little bit you know what else I'm wondering are we live in Maplewood my, my understanding is we're still in Maplewood that the shows were showing there. If anybody in Maplewood is watching this, for some reason, uh, for the month of January anyway, Maplewood did not have its act together and these shows were still playing live uh, for some reason. So, because they said they'd be cut off and everything and, and so evidently they didn't do or have the technology to change it yet. Uh, so, or have worked it out. And I would encourage you to go watch Diana Longry's, if you get a chance to see it replay, show about how Maplewood is handling the, um, the issue with public access TV. Uh, because all these promises they made that we're going to be better, we got better direction, and, and now they're going to have meetings on what their direction is going to be. But you guess what? The public's not invited. It's a small group of people. So here we got Communist Maplewood uh, going to dictate everything to you without public input, as far as we're told. And citizen involvement is not going to be part of the uh, public access TV. So um, anyway, that's interesting side going on. Hey, while I was gone, City Pages ran an article, a couple articles about one of my guests, and we're going to talk about that, who is now running for U.S. Rep uh, against Tom Emmer in the 6th Congressional District. And then the last thing we're going to talk about is the appellate court hearing that I filmed today that dealt with harassment restraining orders and filing motions to modify them. Uh, fascinating and I, I'll tell you this you're gonna want to watch this show if you know of anybody that's had a harassment restraining order or an order for protection you're gonna find out what it's really like and why you need to do certain things and if you don't do them or you go half-hearted it's gonna come back to bite you and they've basically established these harassment restraining orders in such a way that if you feel you have to get one it's over your marriage is over, everything's over. Uh, these judges are so vindictive, and, and especially in my opinion, Judge Kirk was just crazy at this appellate court hearing. You're gonna see it, where the rules don't matter. Uh, filing motions don't matter. You don't get a hearing. It doesn't matter whether the motion's true or not. Uh, it's, it's too bad even though it's the legal process. And I was surprised. I went down there because I, I knew this man that was uh, uh, doing the appellate, uh, filing the appeal. Matter of fact, uh, he was the one 
case that went to the appellate court and the Supreme Court said, hey, you're not, if you have a child out of wedlock, you're the father, you don't have any standing, okay? You as a, uh, as a non-custodian, you only get time with that child if the mother lets you have that time. You, you got to come in afresh, and the best you can get is uh, there's no joint physical custody going on there. Then you don't have a chance of it. The best you get is parenting time. And so, and the laws have changed since then. Uh, but he took that fight. You know, why should the mother have a presumption of joint physical custody and have that as her minimum? You know, and, and, and the father's just out of the picture. You know, he done all the paternity test. It was his. He knew it. He took responsibility uh, for the child, but he couldn't see the child at all because the mother set up uh, certain dynamics. Well, he had a, a harassment restraining order, and that's what this case was about. And, of course, we've done other cases about harassment restraining orders. So uh, you're going to find out how it works. Okay. A uh, couple things, uh, one of probably the most exciting thing that happened out in Oregon was the first day I was there, the first morning, uh, I was there, took a walk down to the beach, and on the way back, there were two fighter jets flying overhead that were in a dogfight. Okay, it, it was practice. And they were shooting off their flare trailers, you know, for missiles coming in and stuff like that. and. So it was a kind of a miniature fireworks display up there in the sky with these planes turning on a dime. Yeah, you know, they made sharp turns. And, and uh, I took video with my uh, phone camera, but, uh, you know, when the light's so bright, you can't see the screen. So I missed it. I couldn't tell whether I was recording or not, and I, I missed it. <laughs> so you don't get to see that uh, jet fight. It's kind of uh, interesting. You know, if the jets are close, if you can hear them, uh, and you're the target, yeah, they, they got you. <laughs> it's, that, uh, it's that bad. Uh, so, hey, let's go. I don't know if anybody's in my control room here. Um, let's talk about uh, City Pages here. City Pages, I had a guest on, A.J. Kern, and she was talking about, she's a guest columnist for the St. Cloud Times. And she was talking about uh, the refugee, Muslim refugee situation up in St. Cloud and the immigrant. She didn't use Muslim. I'm using Muslim. Um, but the problem that that's, that's taking place up in St. Cloud. We're not live in Maplewood. We're not live in Maplewood, yeah. is what I'm hearing. As of the second week in January. Okay. As it took some time all right. to... As of the second week in January, because it took some time to change things over. So we're not live in Maplewood. Um, people, you're not getting your money's worth. I'll tell you that. Uh, what a scam. All right, so A.J. Kern, uh, guest columnist, St. Cloud Times, uh, was on the show a couple times talking about immigration status and what's going on with immigration inside the United States. The United Nations having uh, authority and taking money from the United States and telling the United States what refugees they get. And they're shipping a lot of refugees, and especially Muslim ones, into St. Cloud. And these Muslim refugees are demanding that they have certain uh, uh, amenities given to them regarding their, their faith. Now, under, you've heard my position on, on the Muslim faith. Because it doesn't matter whether you're black, white, or it's got all nationalities in the Muslim faith. That faith is designed to kill anybody that's not a Muslim. Okay? That's, that's where it's at. There's so much information out on the Internet. There's so, much, so many studies done by this. Okay? Uh, Christianity doesn't do that. Jesus treated women different than Muhammad did. R Muhammad ordered the murdering of women. Jesus told the woman caught in adultery, you know, go and sin no more, but also told her, uh, told the accusers, who's without sin, cast the first stone. 
And so you have this whole different dynamic how Jesus treated women and how Muhammad. Muhammad raped little girls. Uh, Muhammad raped women. You know, that, that was part of the life of Muhammad. And so you ask the question, what would Muhammad do? Ask that question. Google, what would Muhammad do? You know, and you're going to find out how he lived his life. And so these people are for a theocracy. That's all they will accept. They will order their system to work towards that. And they will say it. Their whole goal is to overthrow our uh, system of government here. Okay? Not that there isn't some things that should be taken over, <laughs> you know, but not with a theocracy. Now, we found a way to live in peace, supposedly, uh, to some extent, by having our unalienable rights. Well, A.J. Kern was talking about this, and City Pages did an article on her because they found out she was going to run for U.S. rep against um, Tom Ammer. That's what I understand. And so they tried to do a hit piece on her before the news got out that she was running against Tom Emmer. Well, now the news is out. She's running against Tom Emmer. And I put my endorsement behind A.J. Kern. Tom Emmer is not the man he says he is as far as conservative politics, conservative government. And I've had plenty of talks with Tom Emmer down at the Capitol. And you have to, he, 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 he doesn't get it until he gets it and then he forgets. So he'll make the right votes if the right kind of pressure is put on him and the right type of education. It doesn't come intuitive to him about the right thing to do. And so with the support of Boehner and doing the increased spending and I'm not going to cause waves. Well, there's plenty of freshmen that came in and Tom Emmer came in with the support of the Tea Party and he just blew them off. Well, A.J. Kern is not going to go against her principles. Uh, or the principles of the people that elect her, and she's for a conservative government. And so I'm all for her. And City Pages, what City Pages did is painted her as A.J. Kern as anti refugee. And then with her, it was mentioned that she was on my show. She was on Speechless with Tim Kinley. And then the next article came out and lumped a bunch of people as being anti refugee which is not the case at all. I am for our country having refugees, especially if we fight a war and uh, there are good people that are suffering and we lose the war. And, and ask yourself this question, how many wars have we won? How many wars are we winning? You know, we're, we're not. And we're taking in all these refugees and it makes you wonder if there's a plan out there to fight people Make sure you lose the war, bring in all these refugees, and with their ideology to overthrow our, our government. <laughs> I mean, that's what it looks like to me is taking place. But not all immigrants are, are that way. Not all, but I am anti-Muslim immigration because they are avowed against our country. By definition, they are treasonous to the United States of America with their faith. And, and why would we do that? It is a mistake to bring your enemy into your country and then give them your money. That's a mistake. These people should be going to, the Sunnis should be going to Sunni countries, the Shiites should be going to Shiite countries. And uh, they come here and we give them help and then they want to take us over and say, no, change your system. Um, we want Sharia law. Not good. Well, A.J. Kern uh, running for U.S. rep. City Pages trying to bash her, trying to lump a whole bunch of people into the anti-refugee category. It was a poorly written article. They never contacted me. And uh, anyway, it was there. <laughs> Just a little update. And so I would hope that you would vote for A.J. Kern for U.S. rep. And and that uh, she gets the endorsement up there. Uh, they really need it. Uh, she really needs it. And so does that area. It needs good representation. All right, St. Paul School Board. You know, they had a big hoopla over Valentine's Day issue coming up. And, of course, a whole new board is out there. And 
not whole new, at least four of the seven are new. And what we, uh, some of the concerns was the violence in the school. And John Broderick, who was not up for election, but an old school board member, has joined in with the new four in saying, we got to be fair to our teachers. So I got a clip here where John Broderick is saying to Superintendent Silva, this needs to be addressed. And here, here's what he's saying. And, and, and as, as of course you know, Ms. Walker, in my case, I always come down to that concrete example or incident that yep. might occur yep. in a classroom or in the hallway outside getting on the buses, when a student is asked to do something, and that student absolutely, not only willfully refuses, but does so with some colorful language with it. And that's where, when the rubber meets the road, those are the kinds of questions, as we, do, as we send out these messages of reassurance, Many of our staff members are asking those questions. What are we supposed to do? And I think somewhere in our general kinds of messages, we have to get into the specifics. Now, I don't want to go supervise buses, and I sure don't want to teach any classes anymore, but I do want teachers to know what they can and cannot do. Yeah, so very uh, interesting statement there, and that's, all in context of the teacher violent student misbehavior and uh, throwing out terminology uh, willful disobedience is no longer a terminology that's used in the discipline process in the St. Paul schools. So what is the teacher to do? How is the teacher to behave in certain situations? And the school district has abandoned the teachers when it comes to discipline. And because we're not going to suspend any child because that hurts the child. Well, it hurts all the child. And so prior to that, there's this conversation about what are our core values in, in the St. Paul? What are we trying to teach? And I, I just thought it was amazing uh, that they would have this, that they don't know what it is. Now, as a new board, they're going to work it out, and they're going to try to tell um, Superintendent Silva as to what the board's core, core value is. But I tell you, Silva was there fighting tooth and nail for her values, and she says, look, it's part of my contract uh, that I have a say, and if I don't agree with what you say, then it doesn't happen. You know, we got to come to agreement on what to do before, you know, it gets implemented. And, and they've already implemented this uh, safe, strong school, strong communities program. And people don't understand it. And it's, it hasn't worked well. And it's not working for the students. You know, but now they're saying it's working better. Well, uh, we don't know that, okay? So here's the discussion between Superintendent Silva and the new board member, John, uh, I forget his last name. Um, anyway, let's hear this discussion. Just, I just wanted to ask and, and Director Schumacher, you talk about core values and I'm struggling to, to what is a core value? Because I think that's what the issue is. And, and how the letter came out and the principle. I think all of us have maybe some core values that they're different. So then how do we go back and look at this policy and the religious policy and the quality <coughs> policy and you said we need to look at our core values. So can you give me a little bit more on that? Well, I, I think that, you know, we just heard about core values of inclusion and um, and friendship, uh, building community, uh, um, the, the kinds of, uh, you know, the, the golden rule, the way, we, the way we treat each other, the way, you know, equity, these kinds of things that we talk about that are, are critical. Th these are American values. This yeah. is what um, 
this is what we all uh, love and and, uh, and want to fight for. So I think that when you have a conversation like this, um, there are people that want to call into question whether what you're doing reflects that. And I, I just think that there are those values that we all agree on that are central to who we are um, uh, as Americans, really. Um, and, and that those are the kinds of things that you can build on. Um, but also who we are as humans, who we are in terms of treating each other um, the, uh, in ways that uh, are, are really positive and inclusive and, and make everybody feel a part of it. I mean, I, when you think about people who have commented about, well, gee, you know, you, you won't let the kids have fun, which kids? Um, the best kind of an event is an event where everybody has fun. Yes. Um, and, and to take that into account, the way this principal has tried to do and build this community and understand how that works um, with the kind of diversity we have and the kinds of new uh, cultures that, that uh, we try to understand and we try to honor and respect. You know, those are the kinds of, the way we go about uh, doing that, I think. Um, those are the important values that we want to instill in our kids. And that's what I think is being done. The conversation uh, is a fine conversation to get into about whether or not uh, St. Valentine's Day is, a, is an American uh, sacred holiday or not. But, um, you know, at the heart of this is that what we're about as a district, what we're about with our kids, and how we honor that and how we want to model our behavior for them so that they grow up being the kinds of contributing community members that all take care of us in our old age, which is really what I'm concerned about. <laughs> <laughs> I just had to go there. Okay. Right? There's no bottom line. He's been transparent about the kind of game I mean, I was talking about. Yeah, that was, <clears throat> that was pretty funny there. <laughs> um, you know, yeah, who... Hey, I mean, it's, it's a good point. Do you want to raise children so that they're respectful, yet bold, uh, they're not going to get walked on, yet, yet respectful? And you want them to have values so that when you are older, you, you have a peaceful society. You, you want that. And so, you know, here, here's a school that forces you to take your kids there unless you have the financial means to go someplace else um, because the state funding and everything. And so they're, they're talking about core values. What should it be? And here's the big thing they have missed. Now, I've gone down there twice and told them, your number one priority, your number one core value. And, and they're talking about, well, whose core values? The, the board of directors or the administration or the teachers or the teachers' union. Of course, they're all fighting against each other. Well, what about the people? It's my question. In our Constitution, the people of Minnesota said, hey, here is our core value that you must do. It's essential to your existence. And that is... The public schools are to have an educated public, to raise kids to an educated public in order to preserve the Republican form of government. And frankly, they're not doing that. You got socialists, avowed, admitted socialists on the board. They don't want a Republican form of government. That, but that's our Constitution. That's what they have to do. And there's no talk about that. A well-educated public is what our Constitution calls for in order to preserve a Republican form of government. Not a socialist form, not a communist form, not a theocracy, but a Republican form of government. And they're not even talking about that. I'm going to have to go down and remind them again. So you have core values? Yeah, let's get, a, get along here. That's important. Do we have diversity? Yeah, but we don't have diversity to the point that we drown out other diversity, that we don't drown out the Christian community, okay? We don't have that kind of diversity where we drown out holidays and traditions that we've had. What's wrong with Muslims learning some of our traditions? Nothing. They're going to force their traditions on you. 
like they're doing in other countries where they're just hacking to death Christians, beheading them, raping the women. Finally, there's some godly Christian women out there who are taking up the guns and saying, no, you don't have the right to rape me. God has not given me the responsibility to let you rape me and not to do something about it. And, and same with the, the children out there where these men are raping the children. You know, if there's one thing we're called to do in the United States is to stop that from happening. That's our core values. Yet, it seems to me in certain schools, in certain cultures, that this is something that's going to be taught. What would Muhammad do? So, um, what would Muhammad do? Google it. You'll find out. <laughs> okay? You'll see what these people are doing is what Muhammad would do. They'll behead you if you don't become a Muslim. All right. So, what, what are the core values that St. Paul Public Schools should have? Is one of those getting rid of Valentine's Day? Because a lot... A big part of that community doesn't celebrate Valentine's, really? Well, isn't that what school about, is teaching different cultures? Don't have to participate in it, but you can teach about it. You can do a lot of things. But to just totally exclude it and ignore it, um, you know, I, I don't think so. <laughs> you know, using these as teachable moments and you'll let it go by. All right, let's go to this appellate court hearing here. Um, it's, it's amazing uh, what took place in, in, as far as harassment and restraining orders. And Eric Cardell is the attorney in this case uh, at the appellate court. I don't think he was in district court. He, he may have been. I, I just don't know. But let's hear what issue one here is about what this case was about. And first, uh, the standard of review is under Rule 60.02 is abuse of discretion. Uh, however, legal issues are reviewed de novo, and the highlighted legal issue here is an evidentiary hearing required before an order based on a credibility determination. Uh, if we have a few legal points to make. First, we agree with the court that the respondent is incorrect, the lower court, that's at page five. The review of the harassment restraining order is available under Rule 60.02e. Uh, that, that provision is it is no longer equitable for the judgment to have prospective application. The, the slight point of difference with the lower court <laughs> is we believe the court has inherent authority under Larson, the 1917 decision, to, under common law principles to modify any court injunction. Uh, that's important. The typical case, of course, being when there's misconduct of the plaintiff, the defendant raises that issue. Uh, and then the court could modify uh, the order accordingly. To go in, modify a court order, make a motion, and does there have to be an evidentiary hearing? And by the rules, yes. But it's not happening in uh, many of these harassment <coughs> restraining orders. In it's even evidently been become the culture of Hennepin County that this doesn't happen. Uh, so if you're going to put a harassment restraining order on someone or if there's one coming against you or an order for protection coming against you, number one, my advice, it's not a legal advice, my personal opinion is you got to fight it tooth and nail from the beginning and you say I can save money I just want to leave this person not be around this person and get out of there they're going to play all this garbage on me and accuse me of stuff I just need to get out of here you know it's not going to work because it's going to affect your life in many many ways because it'll all be thrown out always thrown at you with an accusation it's hard enough even with a harassment restraining order or with a uh, OFP to fight those things anyway because of how judges behave on these issues. Oh, domestic violence, oh, you know, somebody, there's a victim out there. It must have happened, even though 40% are false. Well, that means 60% are true, you know, so you need a judge. You need to have a hearing. 
it will affect your life, and that will come up in the hearing. So one thing I want you to know, Judge Kirk here from uh, Clay County, uh, he was part of establishing the domestic violence procedures uh, and is a strong advocate uh, against domestic violence. This guy should not have been on this case because he's as biased as can be, and it, and it just shows. Where he doesn't care whether you got a hearing or not, what doesn't matter what the rules are. Well, we'll we'll see this. So, was this an abuse of discretion for the lower court not to have an evidentiary hearing when the rule says there is, and then we need to try and find out if um, uh, there is credible information? All right, let's go to the next clip to see what the second issue is. Uh, our second uh, legal point is uh, Hassinger's uh, affidavit in support of modifying the TRO was unrebutted, and it stands as an unrebutted affidavit and a prima facie case for modification entitling him to an evidentiary hearing if credibility determinations are made in the order. <laughs> Here you go. You, you put in an affidavit, you put a motion in, and there's no uh, counter motion. There's no rebutting of this affidavit. Uh, the time comes for the hearing. You don't get the hearing. You got your motions there. The other side doesn't present anything, and the judge just goes, well, it's, you, you don't get your hearing. Well, I, I, got tes I got evidence here that the harassment restraining order, there was something wrong with it, and that the provisions don't apply anymore, and here's why, and here's the evidence. And... By rule and by, by court rules, if you put an affidavit and it is not responded to, th then you've just forfeited your position. But evidently not with uh, OFPs or harassment restraining orders. And the, these judges are playing this game where the rules don't matter anymore. And so we're going to see more of this... Uh, Unrebutted affidavit, you hear about that. Those who are silent consent, except when a judge doesn't want it that way, <laughs> okay? Judge will use that all the time. There was an affidavit that came in with a motion. The other side didn't respond. You forfeit the issue. That's it. Well, unless it's in these issues. Of course, there's no rule or law that says uh, that they can forfeit the uh that they can go against the motion that's filed. Uh, they just do it anyway. Okay, uh, the next clip here is just some of the facts of the case. So let's listen to this. Uh, the fact setting is that Mr. Hassinger had agreed to the initial harassment restraining order, so there were no findings of fact. It would be a much different case if there had previously been a credibility determination. So if the HRO had been issued, based on a credibility determination that Mr. Hassinger was a problem, then it might have been different. But here, he had, there were no findings of fact. In fact, at Addendum 12, the original harassment restraining order says, in lieu of an evidentiary hearing, you know, we're going to enter this order. And that's a typical procedure used in the HRO process in Hennepin County District Court. Uh, the affidavit itself, um, I'll just highlight a few. Uh, provisions, but Mr. Uh, Hassinger proposed at, at paragraph 12 that, that the order was not pr providing any more benefit to the petitioner because of the actions he had taken to remove himself from her life. Since I have no desire to contact petitioner again, I just want to put this behind me and move on. Its dismissal or termination would not change anything because I have perfectly abided by the order but would instead let things move on. His theory of why he needed a modification was because he's in information technologies and he's a security, uh, information security officer, and, and this was problematic for advancements in his career. Also, could I, could I interrupt you just, just for a second? There, uh, I, I had a question as I was going through the briefing and uh, refers to uh, your brief, page six. And my question is Is it true that your client initially sought? Uh, in order for protection or HRO, I can't remember which, um, against the respondent earlier, he, he and sought, then he dismissed it? He sought an order for protection, which was dismissed after an evidentiary hearing. And the evidentiary hearing there was that the allegations and Judge McCaig's order is in the addendum. Uh, it, there was not a credibility determination made. 
but it was dismissed because there wasn't evidence that he would suffer physical harm, bodily injury, or assault. Thank you. That's that's all I uh, that's all I needed. And, th and that occurred after this stipulated order was entered in March of 2014. Is that correct? Uh, uh, that's correct. And that's also relevant because he found out after that hearing about the uh, the violations of uh, the the Ms. Caprica's violation of his federal driver privacy protection act information through normandale college this has been advertised in the newspapers and there's big a circuit uh, decisions on this the sapentia law firm has brought all these lawsuits against police officers but here there was a breach of his private data uh, th through normandale a community college where uh, she she works or knows a worker there and that was but that's isn't, been but isn't your remedy for all of that to bring a harassment restraining order against her you yeah. know why wasn't that done uh, uh, he tried, his method was trying for the OFP, and then he did not follow up on that. Well, a lot of times uh, in these cases, there's not sufficient evidence for an OFP, but there way, may well be for a harassment order because it's a much lower standard, and it would seem he should have done that, shouldn't he? I think he had removed himself so effectively with the, the safe home program that it was impossible for her to contact him, and that was part of his argument in his affidavit was that, you know, I, I did that because she stalked me by illegally accessing my information and continuing to pursue and, and badmouth him. And, and Mr. Cardle, was, was, was um, um, uh, Ms. Krup, I hope I pronounced right, Ms. Krupika was, was at the time, well, does the record indicate at the time he moved to vacate the order, was she still living at his house? No, he had, at the time that we made that motion, yes. he was removed, and in the in the in the state program, uh, so it's hard to identify the location and address of someone. He had removed himself completely, and so there was repose in that regard. And that's no, no. My question was was I mean was was she still living? I mean, I, I seem to recall the record indicating that you know he had to move out from his house that he was paying a mortgage on. My was reading that's that? right. Was she still living there at that house when? He was trying to vacate the order. Uh, not, not in the motion that I brought. No. Okay. Yeah, and and that that had all uh, been resolved. Okay. All right. Uh, fascinating. There. Here's the guy uh, that stipulated saying, "Okay, I'm I'm going to do this. Fine. Do your OFP. You're out of my life. Uh, you know, I've moved on. I've I've actually sold my house." so that I, I'm in another place and I'm under the safe home program so that you can't find me. You want to put the OFP on, fine. Let's just get, out, get this done with. Well, in the meantime, he does advancements in, in work. He's trying to get new jobs. The OFP keeps popping up and, and uh, could be stopping his advancement or trying to do other work as a... a um, uh, in the emergency arena of uh, uh, ambulance work, EMT. Uh, and, and that is a preventative. So he goes back into court and says, hey, under these new circumstances, look, here's the deal. It's preventing my job growth and opportunities. And guess what? She's not afraid of me. She's so not afraid of me. She bashes me all she can. And she's willing to violate federal law and go in and look and find out where I'm living. Okay, and through through the the records there illegally do this, and so there's no fear here on her part. She's trying to hunt me down, you know, trying to find out where I am so she can harass me. Okay, and uh, so you know. Let's have an evidentiary hearing about whether she's really in fear. Let's get rid of this OFP. Let's move on. She doesn't know where I live. I'm done. I'm done with her. All right. So much so that I sold my house and went into hiding. Well, okay. Uh, that's kind of what they're arguing over. But again, this is about whether he gets to argue these things. And, and this issue came up was fascinating. Was this all self-serving? You, you file an affidavit. And now it's called self-serving because it's on your behalf. Well, all 
affidavits are on your behalf. All of them are self-serving, but they have this special category of self-serving. This is a fascinating argument here. It just shows you how ridiculous the domestic violence industry has, has come. You know, so let, let's listen to it. I, I think you'll get a lot out of it. The problem I have with this whole thing is this started out apparently, you know, with a petition for an order for protection that she filed. Parties appear at a hearing in 2014, March 5th, and apparently your client's represented by an attorney and she's not represented at that hearing. And your client signs a stipulation agreeing to be bound by a harassment order for two years. Now, if he wants to modify that under the provision you're referring to, isn't it up to him to show that she no longer fears your client before the court would be justified in taking any action on this restraining order? Uh, right, and that's, that's exactly our argument. And your concern is, is our, our, our sort of proof in that we submitted an unrebutted affidavit uh, basically saying... But it's self-serving. It's not an affidavit from her saying, you know, I don't, I'm not afraid of him anymore. Uh, That's I, what I would usually see in these cases as a trial court judge, not <clears throat> some self-serving affidavit from the person who's the, the restrained person saying, gee, this is interfering with my life. That isn't enough. Uh, right, and, and that, that argument is uh, echoed in the respondent's brief uh, that the affidavit is self-serving. But, you know, uh, with respect to Judge Kirk and to my friend uh, counsel here, um, that's just words. Uh, you need to argue based on affidavits. And when an affidavit is unrebutted, then the arguments of the lawyer are viewed as self-serving when you haven't gotten an affidavit rebutting the affidavit. Well, so, there, so my, there's nothing in the, in the record saying that she is no longer concerned about his behavior. And that's the issue. He agreed to this for two years. The only way it goes away is if she moves to dismiss it or there's evidence that she is no longer feeling unsafe as it relates to his behavior. Uh, but there is an affidavit uh, saying, uh, detailing how he's removed uh, uh, himself uh, from uh, her knowing where he is and that he has abided perfectly with the court order. And there's no rebutting affidavit saying that she still fears him. Right. So we need a, a statement from Ms. Patrika in that regard in order for the them to argue that. For example, the, to take this to absurd length, on page 8 of uh, on the opening of the, uh, of the brief of the respondent, uh, quote on page 8, Hassinger's continued attempts to dismiss the HRO, including this appeal, are nothing more than thinly veiled attempts to continue to harass Caprica any way he can. I mean, that's an astounding statement, and they don't even have Ms. Caprica saying that in an affidavit. And further, um, even if she did, how would she prove that? That here, I am standing here harassing Ms. Caprica, who I've never met, through this legal proceeding. I mean, this is some sort of advocacy gone wrong that one could make credibility determinations regarding a person without an evidentiary hearing and without a rebutting affidavit. So uh, Judge Kirk, I think the, uh, petition, the uh, petitioner, the respondent, has gone too far in alleging that based on this record with no evidentiary hearings, that my client is a continued harasser even through this process. Wow, that's, that's just amazing, fascinating. Uh, you know, in the prior video, Judge Kirk was telling uh, Eric Cardle and, and Paul Hazinger, the client, him what to file. Shouldn't he have done this? Shouldn't he have done that? Well, yes and no. It's up to him to decide. He thought, because there's this process to go and amend, he thought he would do that. Judge Kirk doesn't say why that's wrong to do that, because he gets to do that. But Kirk wants him to do it a different way. No, Paul Hansinger wants the harassment restraining order off because it was a fraud to begin with, and now it's causing problems. 
Now he wants an evidentiary hearing. And Judge Kirk is going, no, no, you can't have one. We don't want one. <clears throat> and so much to the fact in the, in the last video we saw is that now he's come... Uh, this is a self-serving affidavit. Well, it's his affidavit. Okay? And so there's nothing in the rules that says you have to have this letter saying, I am no longer afraid. You don't have to have that. She could have responded and said, I am afraid, like uh, Attorney Eric Cardle said. But she didn't. Because the evidence is contrary to that. Okay? And... and Paul Hainsinger needs to, needed an evidentiary hearing to show that. Look at her behavior. It's contrary to somebody living in fear. And then, and then to say that Paul Hazinger and Eric Cardell are harassing through the legal process when there's no evidentiary hearing and they don't even get to have an evidentiary hearing on whether there's harassment through the legal process. It's just thrown into the responsive brief in the appellate court. This is unbelievable. And Eric Cardle, man, he hit hard on that one. That was, that was like, what's going on here, court? You gonna let this type of behavior happen? I mean, these things are happening every day or, you know, multiple, multiple times a month that if you file a lawsuit to protect yourself against somebody who's abusing you, if you're male, then it's now considered harassment. It's continued harassment because you're continuing to bring it before the court. Wow. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, there were some, I mean, this is a, this is an all-out battle going on here. You know, Eric Cardle has made a name for himself. He wants free speech for judges. Uh, he argued a case in the Supreme Court uh, about judicial freedom of speech and running for elections in Minnesota, won it in the U.S. Supreme Court, and it ticked off all these elite judges. And you know what? He's facing them. And they're fighting back hard. You know, and they're playing dirty. And Eric Cardle's just saying, hey, here's the law. Let's, this judge abuses discretion. Let's have our evidence hearing. It's required by law. And then these guys are going to throw him out. All right. Um, let's see. Let's go to uh, rebut one, okay? That's uh, third to the last one there, rebut one. Um, they, they had a discussion about collateral damage. I don't think we'll have enough time to see that, about the effects of what a harassment restraining order does or, or order for protection does and the consequences. They had a big discussion on that, and uh, it, it was fascinating. I'm going to put the whole hearing up on the Internet so you can see it at uh, speechlessmn uh, forward slash excuse me, youtube.com forward slash speechless MN. But let's uh, look at the rebuttal here. Uh, basically, the, 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 the uh, defense here just basically reiterated everything these judges were talking about. Didn't add anything new. Okay, so uh, that's why I'm not playing her. There wasn't anything big about what she was saying. Okay, let's play this video. Uh, may it please the court. My, uh, uh, first of all, uh, I did acknowledge the abuse of discretion standard. I just said that as a general matter, uh, whether a, a court can make credibility determinations without an evidentiary hearing is one that can be reviewed de novo, sort of automatically an abuse of discretion. That occurred here. With respect to Addendum 6, if we look at uh, the sort of the selectively quoting two parts of the affidavit but not addressing the whole affidavit, that should be very disconcerting to an appellate court when you have allegations of a self-serving affidavit, even though it's unrebutted, and you have the uh, uh, trial uh, uh, judge here signing off on just two parts of a very extensive affidavit. That's very disconcerting. With respect to the respondent's use of Costello and Varner v. Varner, this is the sentence that was read at page 14. 
But the <clears throat> district court, as the finder of fact, is not required to believe uncontradicted testimony if there are any reasonable grounds to doubt its credibility. <coughs> the, the only connection between those cases and the respondents' arguments are uncontradicted testimony. Because when the court acts as a finder of fact that's based on an evidentiary hearing, the court cannot, without an evidentiary hearing, make credibility determinations regarding an unrebutted affidavit. Now again, I conceded, if there had been an evidentiary hearing previously in this proceeding, that a, a, even a different judge could take that credibility determination from the earlier ruling and apply it to the affidavit later. I don't have a problem with that. I, I, very fascinating. <laughs> I just can't. You got to have findings of fact, and you got to have an evidentiary hearing in order to get those findings of fact as far as credibility goes. But here, this didn't even take place, and the judge says not credible. Not get, not doing it without a no evidentiary hearing. Okay, we're running out of time here, so we got our last video. It runs about five minutes where there is a real back and forth. <laughs> Hear that? I thought it's pretty exciting. These things are not boring, to say the least. Uh, but remember, your liberty's at stake here um, in, in many, many ways. All right, let's watch this. Oh, uh, rebut change of circumstance. Should be a second. Sure, but what specifically is the change of circumstances from the moment that the order was initially signed? Let's use one. Uh, the plaintiff's misconduct uh, that's alleged uh, uh, getting into his private how, data. How does, how does that impact whether she's entitled to relief against him? It may impact whether he has a right to bring a similar action against her, but she wasn't restrained from doing anything as it relates to him as part of this initial order. If a, if a, uh, if a, uh, a beneficiary of an injunction uh, violates... This isn't uh, an injunction, it's a harassment. Of the harassment restored or violates the rights of another party, that's a change of circumstances. It shows intent. He also asserted... It, no, you're wrong on that, Counsel. It is not. Explain to me how it is. How does it, that change her need to be protected from him? It may create a need for him to be protected from her, but it doesn't change her need. Uh, There's obviously a problem in this relationship. That's why the order was issued. Uh, yes, and the, 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 the court asked for a change of circumstance. This occurred afterwards, uh, and, and I was using But how does that change anything related to her need for protection? Okay, from and that, so that's a different question. And, and, and that question, it, it changes the relationship ostensibly uh, she was a victim. Now he's a victim. So that would well, have Well, now he claims he's a victim, but the way to uh, establish that is to bring his own harassment restraining order. Uh, he no, certainly had the right to do that. And he had a right to bring this <clears throat> motion, as the lower court found, and he pointed well, why, to... Why, he, why? We often have mutual restraining orders between parties where there's been action on both sides. We don't vacate one. Uh, all right, so my, my client comes forward with an affidavit, uh, Judge Kirk, and says... This uh, in continuing harassment restraining order is not necessary. There's no benefit to her, and yeah, there's damage minute, to me. There was some horse trading that went on at that first hearing. She, she came in looking for an OFP. He obviously didn't want an OFP, and for a lot of reasons. An OFP creates a, a lot of circumstances that are different than a harassment order. He negotiates for a harassment order. She agrees. They negotiate a two-year term. That was part of the agreement. He could have perhaps gotten it a one-year agreement, maybe didn't pursue that, maybe his attorney should have. The fact of the matter is there was this give and take, and they ended up with an agreement that this is the route that would be used to you know, deal with the friction left in this relationship. Yeah, he, I think he pursued a one-year and ended up getting a two-year. But going along with the analogy, because uh, well, I think it's a the good record one. says that they stipulated to a two-year. Am, am I wrong on that? Uh, I, 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 I can't. I don't, I don't remember that specifically. I've just based on my. I'd, I'd have to go back and look. I don't have time. But I believe it, he, somewhere it says he won one year. But anyway, with respect to your, the analogy then of the contract, then we have to go all the way. And that would be and, and consider the implied uh, duty of good faith and fair dealing. And there, of course, then... This, isn't a con we, this is a harassment restraining order under the criminal code, 609, Chapter 609. It's not a civil contract. Uh, Judge Kirchner, I was uh, addressing uh, your point of uh, comparing it to a contract, and I was agreeing with you. 
that we, we, go, we go with that and we go with your example, your metaphor, and I'm just saying that the change of circumstances, she breached by accessing his data and doing other these things that are unrebutted. So if you have an agreement and then you have the petitioners, the beneficiary of the agreement, violating it after the agreement, then that can be raised as an issue. But a general point You're is- You're missing the point. It, it doesn't go to whether or not the restraining order was still appropriate for her. And there's nothing in the record that tells us that. If, if we were to accept your position any time a person who's a subject of a harassment restraining order had had five minutes of good behavior, he could say, well, there's been a change of circumstance. I haven't harassed her in the last five minutes. I mean, where, where do you draw the line when you have an agreement that it's going to be a specific term? It's that specific term. Well, I, 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 well, I, I indicated that when we agreed that change of circumstances would be on one instance, and we have an unrebutted affidavit where she violated his federal rights to information, that would be the kind of change of circumstance where you'd say, yeah, we have to look into this. We have to hear a hearing. But generally speaking, the presentation, uh, Judge Kirk, that was made through the affidavit that was unrebutted was this injunction has out, you, you, out, you, utilize, out, uh, been spent. Its usefulness has been spent with time, and there's no usefulness in it going forward. And that was unrebutted. And so the, so the case was made it's not useful anymore to her. And then there wasn't an affidavit coming back. And the way that the American legal system works is if you don't have that affidavit, the advocacy of the lawyer is worthless. That's all, Your Honor. Thank you. Well argued. Advocacy of a lawyer is worthless. Here's Judd Kirk. Who cares? You didn't do it the way I wanted to. Even though the law says you get to do it this way, it's not the way I want you to do it. And, uh, you know, they had an agreement, so therefore, you know, that's what it's going to be. It doesn't matter where the law says you can come back in and change this and get it modified with change of circumstances. All right. Well, we're out of time. Thanks for watching. Good to be back. Remember, if you don't stand up for other people's liberties, who's going to stand up for yours? And good men don't do nothing. God bless. Have a great week.